Grass. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study in Judges chapter three, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing so that we may understand this more clearly for what is being represented at that time that is important for our time. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we thank you for the many blessings that you have already provided. We thank you that we can start our day coming together, learning from your word. We need your wisdom, for all wisdom we see comes from you. We need your guidance, for without your guidance, we would not walk upon the proper path. We thank you for your blessings. Today, we seek you so that we may more clearly understand that which is presented before and come to a clearer and more direct understanding of the work that is yet before us. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for these lessons and we ask for your guidance today. For this, we thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, as we were doing our overview yesterday, I believe we have now come to the conclusion from Judges 2 and what we're looking at here in the first portion of Judges 3, that each of the judges are a representation of a message for our time. Any question about that? Does anybody disagree with that? Well, I don't think we could disagree. Um, what what we can, what we're going to have to figure out as we go through this, is what these different judges, what messages they represent, and whether they run concurrently or or um, uh, successively. Concurrently or or consecutively. Consecutively, yes, that's what I meant. I knew it was the wrong word, <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, su successively. No. <laughs> Consecutively. Consecutively, you're right. Okay. Well, su successive also does mean the same thing, but consecutively is the better word. So well, it's, it, it's kind of like saying that Trump and Biden were consecutive presidents. Yeah. Yeah, they came one after the other. Right. Um, so, um, so anyway, we got, um, so we have to figure out what that is, but I think we understand, stand that Othniel would represent, what well, did we figure out who Othniel represents other than the Holy Spirit is symbolized here, but there's a message of repentance. And, and so would it be an aspect of this movement? Well, I think it's a message to the movement because if there is no repentance, then how do you go forward with the messages? Was yes. there not repentance preached by <clears throat> Elijah? Did yeah. he not say to the nation of Israel, repent yeah well and and this becomes really i mean really interesting i mean there's a whole bunch of things this 
last little while that we've found that are interesting. Um, but, you know, you can see when you get to Judges 3, uh, verse um, 13, and he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of the palm trees, or Jericho. And we'll be getting into that in a few minutes. Yeah, so so if we could look at this, we might find that this whole period of the judges and is representing all of the aspects of our message that God has given to us. And so this would be, again, just like Judges 2 is a representation of the message from September 11th to 2023. You know, it's very possible that that's what the rest of Judges is representing, the unfolding of this message uh, within this movement. And, and looking ahead at all these different stories, you start to see how that is true. Right. Um, you know, when you get to Deborah and Barak and, and all these different things that are being talked about by these different, uh, and then Gideon's 300 men in Judges chapter 7. So you're going to see that um, all of these things are going to show different aspects of our message. I mean, we haven't studied it in detail, but just looking ahead, we can see that that's the case. Um, and, and so I think it would be the message consecutively, but they do run uh, parallel as well. So <clears throat> the message doesn't end just because another message begins. Does the first angel's message end because the second angel's message begins? Does the third overtake either of the other two? Yeah, no, they all run together. And so that's what we see with the book of Judges. And then when we get to chapter 17, Micah and the Levite, um, so then you're going to have, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch there because we've already studied that. But that that's actually something that's earlier in the history that's brought in at the end. So it's, it sort of shows this repeat of history again. Um, well. It could be a repeat of history. It could also be a warning to those within the movement not <clears throat> to walk down these other paths. Yeah. And, and then we have, yeah. And then, and the story of Samson becomes really symbolic. Huge. Things in this movement. So, so, I mean, I mean, this is pretty profound. Okay. Now, <clears throat> part of our situation yesterday is that we had specific verses to set the tone for the study of the balance of this chapter. There were some details that we went over, and we went over very quickly. So as we take this... Re and we're going, we're basically going to touch on a couple of things again lightly and then get into a point to address in this, in our conversation today. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known the words of Canaan. Only that generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least, as before, knew nothing thereof. Okay, so this could be paraphrased as, now these are the false doctrines which the Lord allowed to continue within this movement, to test this movement, even, yeah. as, even as many had not known of the past, the battles, the, the doctrines, the truths, the light given in the past when we came out of darkness. Agreed. <clears throat> I have no disagreement with what you just said whatsoever. Yeah, so we came out of darkness. We entered into the land of Canaan, which sim symbolizes this message. Hmm. Well, that's pretty profound. I mean, in and of itself. But just how judges all lines up, uh, just 
and and of course you know i've jumped way ahead but we will see how this how this all fits together okay now would we consider the next verse numerically to be a doubling well three three is a doubling yeah so the answer would be yes <clears throat> Namely, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering of Hamath. Now, I was intrigued because of the cross reference at the first portion of this verse. And we are returned here to Joshua 13, 3. And in this passage that we have already studied, we see that it reads from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the Gazahites, the Ashdodites, the Eshkelonites, the Gittites, the Ekronites, and the Aviites. These are the five words of the Philistines, but how many cities are noted? Well, you got Sihor and Ekron. I'm speaking since it comes here after it states the lords of the Philistines. It gives us these cities Gaza, which we understand to be one of the Philistine cities, Ashdod, okay. Eshkelon. So the yeah. five cities, these are the five lords of the Philistines, you're saying? Right. That's the way the, is that not how the Bible reads? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. But instead of five, there are six. Because if you take a look at this, Gaza, Ashdod, Eshkelon, Gittites, Ekronites, and the Aviites. Now it says also the Aviites. Yes. And, um, Joshua. 13.3, just hang on. Just going to see what the Hebrew says. Please. Because um, it, it would be the form of the Hebrew that would matter because they don't have a separate word. Uh Okay, so what, what they're doing in Hebrew? Yes. So they put a vav in front of a, a word, if you're saying like and or also or things like that. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that when they're listening here, um, uh, so they net less the city of the Philistines, and so you have um, the Azites, um, the Ashdodites, right? Now here they're going to put um, they're going to put these prefixes in front of these words, so it, it's 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 kind of weird how they do this. So so after they mention the Philistium, which is the Philistines, then they have um, the Azath the Azathi is is the, is what's actually written as as it. As a the, but they but they put a he in front of it, so that means the right. Okay. But then in front of the Ashdodites, they put a vav and a ha, so they're actually grouping these two together. Okay, which, which is odd. And then and then they're going to mention Ascalon, and there they're just going to put the he in front. So that's the the 
right? The ha is just yeah. the. And they don't put the vav, the vav ha in front. And then, um, and then the Gittites, they just have ha giti, so the Gittites. And then they're going to put a vav in front of Ekron. So they're going to put and the Ekronites. And then the last one, they're going to put and the Avites. So they're going to put a vav and a ha in front of those. So the way it would read, it would be the cities of the Philistines, um, uh, the Ash, the Ashite, and the Ashdodites, the uh, Eshkelon, uh, Esh, Eshkelonite, the Gizite, or Gittite, pardon me, um, the and the Akronite and the Avite. So, so, so you could actually put these these um, also's actually in a couple of other places. So, don't particularly know why they're doing it that way, but they're grouping. So here, which you have the Gazites and the Astrodolites. So the, the way they're doing this, these ands, and you can see that there in the King James. So they're putting the word and there, that's the vav. But the also is also a vav, right? So they could have put and the avites. So the Gaz, Gazathites and the Ashdodites, the Eshkelonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, also the avites, is how they chose to translate instead of and the avites. But they could have put all those ands as alsos. Okay. But but in the way that they've they've done this, it it appears that you have the five cities of the Philistines, but the way that they're including this is the Avites, the way that I read it, is the Avites are not one of the cities of the Philistines. It's just added on to this list. I, I think that's the way they're interpreting it. Okay. I, so I don't know, I'd have to look about the Avites, who they are. Um and figure that out but. okay now is there anything unimportant in scripture no okay now i'm going to return to a lot of questions over and over again i'm not trying to berate a subject but i am trying to point out that there are issues and there are pieces of a puzzle that are presented for us that sometimes we need to dig upon. Mm -hmm. I agree with what you just had to say, because the understanding of how the Hebrew is presented here will help us to understand other portions of what is being given to us as clues for this time in Earth's history. Yeah, so the Avites don't seem to be part of the Philistines. Now, is there is there a specific city of the Philistines that is not listed here? Well, there's probably lots of yeah. Um, the the main what's the other one? The Gath. No, okay. well, that's not Gath. Yeah. Okay, Gath. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so it's not mentioned, but these are the five lords of the Philistines. So these are the five cities I would assume that the five lords are of. But the Avites wouldn't be one of the cities of the Philistines. Right. Right. So that's why there are six cities mentioned here. So there, so the King James translators understood this when they put also the Avites. They understood that that was an addition to the five lords of the Philistines. Okay. So now so the Philistines list the cities, also the Avites. Okay. So my question about this with the Avites or Avites, however we pronounce this, this is a city that is only mentioned twice in the Bible. Yeah, Deuteronomy 2.23. Would you please read that? Um, and the Avims, which dwelt in Haz Hazarim, even unto Azza, the Kaftorims, 
which came forth of Kaftor, and destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. Okay. The Avims dwelt in Hazarim, so this is mentions another city. Um, so that's probably just the name of the city as it was. Um, don't know where this is. Which Hazarim means villages. Avim is more accurately the Avim, said to live in the villages of Hazarim, which of course makes sense. Um, as far as Gaza and before their expulsion by the Kaftari. So, so they're related somewhat to the Philistines, but it's not of the five lords of the Philistines. Right. I mean, what I, what I was looking at from that portion of Deuteronomy, when <clears throat> you have Azza being mentioned, the cross-reference there also takes us right back to Gaza. Yeah, well, they're related. Yeah. So the same, same word. Okay. Now, I looked at some other items to be prepared for today. When we start looking at the names of these cities... We have meanings to some of these names, but we also have importance for today. Ashdod, which could be Azotus, meaning stronghold. One of the five chief Canaanite Philistine cities, the seat of worship of the fish god Dagon, located halfway between present day Jaffa and Gaza. Right, so right on the coast there. Yeah. Right. What, outside of the fact that they were worshiping a fish god, what other characteristic? has stood out throughout history regarding this false deity. I thought the Pope's martyr was shaped like that. Exactly. Yeah. Are, not, are not the, um, I should call it headdresses of the cardinals shaped in that manner? Yeah, though I don't think there's any relationship historically between uh, the fish god and the shape of the Pope's mitre. Because um, I studied into the development of that. So it, 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 it's a long story, but it, it doesn't appear to be related. It is, it re is it related to that of his cardinals? No, what I'm saying is there's no relationship between their hats okay. and, and this worship. It's it's just a coincidence, it because that because the way that those hats developed over time uh, shows that there's no relationship. So it's like when you get a false etymology, you find a word that sounds the same as some other word, but there's no relationship to it. That's kind of the th the thing is with the Pope's mitre. So it has nothing to do with the fish god Dagon. Okay. I spent some time researching that, the development of that mitre. So any, anybody can do it. it it's, uh, it's kind of interesting, actually. Okay. We then also go to Ashkelon, meaning wandering. One of the five chief Canaanite cities, the seat of the worship of the goddess Dersito located about 19 kilometers or 12 miles north of the present day city of Gaza. Again, identifying Joshua 13.3, but also Jeremiah 47.5. What would we see <clears throat> since these two cities 
are worshiping two separate false deities, what would we see that is similar or different from what we were addressing yesterday? I'm not sure what you're asking. Okay. The deity of Dagon presented more as a male. Okay, you're talking about the female, male and female. Correct. Okay. Again, so you you would have Dagon. I would I would present this almost as a another Baal, another Lord that they're that they're seeking. But would those of that would worship Dercito be like that of the priests of the grove? Mm -hmm. When you're when you take a look at this, especially on this with Dercito, you may be able to apply this also to Aphrodite, to Ishtar, to other feminine deities okay okay so what are you saying is that all the feminine deities are just the same deity or are you just looking at the fact that they're goddesses i'm looking at the fact that they're goddesses and i'm looking and i'm asking is could we make the application that these would be the equivalent to those that would worship in their groves Okay, well, now we have a lot of problems in how we understand, so I'm not sure where you're going here, but when we look at the two Babylons by um, Alexander Hislop, that book is full of misinformation. Um, there's no basis for a lot of his claims. So sometimes we try to associate these different goddesses as being uh, descended from each other. When you, you actually look at the the history of how these different gods and goddesses came about. Um, they're, they're, they're not necessarily related just because they're a pair of, you know, a lord and a lady, so to speak. Um, so I don't know anything about the goddess Deserto. I've never run across this name before. Um, but I don't know if you can just make, I mean, symbolically, you could probably do that. But but I don't think there would be any literal connection. Are we not looking at all of this right now being more in the symbolic sense than the literal sense? Yeah, but you sometimes need to understand the literal sense in order to understand the symbolic. Okay. That's all I'm saying. So I don't know anything about the goddess Deserto, whether, what type of worship it was or anything like that so that's all i'm saying okay <clears throat> it's interesting to me that the philistines at least in these first two cities are showing a divergence of their worship yeah okay one, one other thing so when we deal with these different types of worship, because I mean, you have different religions. They they have a different basis. They're not all the same, same ideas. But you do have a sense in which nature is feminine, where nature is treated as being feminine. Right. Yeah. So they treat nature as feminine, and so the goddesses tend to, and and this is an oversimplification, but tend to be the worship of nature. Because it's it's the mother, right? Mother Earth, all that type of stuff. Right. So definitely symbolically, you can look at goddesses as that sort of new age type of worship, where the male deities would represent more powers. Right? The the forces of nature that are more destructive. Where goddesses tend to be more the the life giving uh, aspects, but that, that I mean that's a simplification.
but it's sort of generally true. Okay. So, you know, you're going to have, uh, you know, Thunder, Thor, he's going to be a male god, right? Where you're going to have uh, a female god be something like Spring. Does that make sense? It adds a bit to it, yes. It just has to do with the ideas of mas what's masculine and what's feminine. Okay. But yet you... In, in this situation, when you when you do take a look at this with Deserto, Deceto, Deceto, or Dercito, Dercito, okay. When we're looking at this, if this is a equivalent to Aphrodite, Aphrodite was being seen as a goddess of war. Mm -hmm. So now, yeah, is a fertility goddess. So correct. Uh, yeah, Aphrodite is not related to, um, uh, you know, um, the the worship of the groves. So Dracida would be more equivalent with, uh, as as a symbol, since it's a fertility god. That would be more aligned with the, the Asherah or Ashtaroth. All right. Ekron. And Derseto is also a mermaid. Okay, so does that have a, a further connotation? of a inner relationship with Dagon. Yeah, yeah, because that's a fish god and then you have this mermaid, so that would make sense. Now we have Ekron, migration. The northernmost of the five chief cities of Palestine appointed to the tribe of Judah in Joshua 13.3, present-day Akir, located 10 kilometers or 6 miles west of Gezer. Then we have Gaza, or Aza. We have here two cities with this name. One is the southernmost of the five chief Palestine cities located seven kilometers or 44 and a half miles south of modern Jaffa and four kilometers or 2.4 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. It was the scene of Samson's exploits, Joshua 11, 22, Judges 16, 1 to 3, Second Kings eighteen eight, Jeremiah twenty five twenty. But it is also a town of the tribe of Ephraim, located on a small plain near Shiloh, as referenced in First Chronicles seven twenty eight. Ashdod is a stronghold. Gaza is strong. Ashkelon, wandering. Ekron, migration. I was unable to find anything about Gittite or Git. But I was able to find a few things that have interrelationship with Gath. When we take a look at Gath, it means a wine press. Again, one of the five chief Philistine cities, home of the giant Goliath from 1 Samuel 17, 4, 2 Kings 12, 17, and 2 Chronicles 26, 6. At the current time, 
the exact location of Gath is not known. But to support Gath being translated as wine press, we have Gath Hefer, the wine press of digging, which was a city of the tribe of Zebulun, located about five kilometers or three miles northeast of Nazareth, home of the prophet Jonah. Joshua 19, 2 Kings 14, 25. Compared that with Gitaim, which translated as two wine presses, a Benjamite town of refuge near Beeroth. Nehemiah 11.33, <clears throat> possibly the site of modern El Ramayam. As we look at these other cities, as we look at their names, if we're looking at this being stronghold or strong, Okay, so just um, dealing with Gath then. So Gitium is just two wine presses, so it's just a plural of Gath. Okay. And it's a dual plural. So two wine presses. So if we're dealing with two wine presses, are we dealing with the ability to or present twice the amount of false doctrine? Or are we dealing with one where there is a correct doctrine and a false doctrine? How do we see this? How should we see it? Now, while we're considering that, a comment from the chat. <clears throat> Durkato is pronounced with a hard C and is mentioned in 2 Maccabees 12, verse 6. It can be a hard C or a soft C. Both are correct. If it's a hard sea, does that also mean that it's a storm? And if it's a soft sea, does that mean it's good sailing? No. Just means if it's a hard sea, it's spelt with the, uh, a, um, the, the, the Greek letter that's a K sound. Okay. So, but <clears throat> both ways. it can be spelled with a sigma as well. How do we approach these five lords of the Philistines? How do we approach the meaning of the name of these cities? Symbolically, what do we find? Could Gath as wine press? symbolically represent CNN and Fox. Well, that would make sense. King of the South and King of the North. Huh? Well, well, I wouldn't be King of the South and King of the North. Well, I guess you could, but, but I think it has to do with the, the, um, the, the drunkards of Ephraim. It's the two different, um, two different errors. So I guess King of the North and King of the South in one context. But okay. So we have it presented that it could be King of the South and King of the North. The other presentation for this of uh, wine press, could this be representational of CNN and Fox as two wine presses since Gittites would be that representing two wine presses? 
Two streams of information. Widely disseminated before the world. Well, I think that would be correct. We'll mingle with the wine of Babylon sooner or later. It would look that way, wouldn't it? It seems so, yeah. So as, as we look at this, we have a, not really a conundrum, but an example that is before us that we cannot rely upon the strength of man or upon man's strongholds or upon man's information for us to be able to understand what God would present before us at this time. That if we were to take these five cities of the Philistines and follow after them, we would be in error. Yes. Any other thoughts with this? Well, I'm just thinking when that when when we were warned warned in the SOP that Satan has myriad ways of trapping us, of tempting us, and he he um, you know he observes us and he thinks, okay, I'm going to try this 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 this. this this distraction or this trick to lure this person off the track of following Christ. He adapts his, his methods to our personalities and our tastes. That's for sure. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Any other thoughts at this point? Okay. Okay, so as we return to this, excuse me, my uh, my mouse decided to be just a little disobedient. I wanted to jump all over the place. So we know that these five cities, along with the Sidonians, the Hivites, they were left to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken under the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their, their fathers by the hand of Moses. We cannot take the word of man. Finite, erring, dying man as being superior to that of God. We have to make a decision for ourselves. As Joshua had stated, Choose ye this day who you will serve. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So here again, we have six different peoples all relative of the children of Israel, but they had all strayed from the worship of the true God. And these were the nations that were round about 
Israel. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and served their gods. They chose to set aside the word of the Lord, not to enter into league with any of the nations. They were not to give their sons or daughters in marriage to these peoples. Yet, in their mind, this was a good choice. Is this to be how we are to live today? Are we not to follow God's word implicitly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we return to this with Othniel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served Balaam and the groves. There's no disagreement here that Baal and the priests of the groves are being mentioned. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan, Reishtham, king of Mesopotamia, or the king of Amram, Naharayim, and the children of Israel served this king eight years. When I looked up the name that's given as the alternative, we come to look upon this as similar to the city where Abraham and his family had dwelt before coming into the promised land. So Haran. So in these situations, it is a king from an area that where Ab Abraham was very familiar. Yet, this is looked upon as also being Mesopotamia. The land of two rivers. The land of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Why are the two rivers important? Well, in um, thinking about the Hittico and the the Uli, yeah, the Uli, yeah. So, in the time of the end, magazine, um, right? Uh, that's Jeff addresses this, the two rivers. That's um, The first article. Um, yeah, because it's uh, the testimony of the two rivers is the first chapter of the Time of the End magazine. So Jeff says, uh, certainly the visions given by the Uli in the Hittical are part of the story of Daniel, but how important are they to us today? Sister White puts great emphasis upon the study of Daniel and Revelation in connection with bringing it on a revival. Um, so... Anybody else with more thoughts on that? Can't remember his conclusions.
So he says, as we continue the series of studies, we should solemnly accept the command to study these prophecies and humbly pray for the promised light, which will be found by those who strive to be among the wise. Individually, we need to recognize our responsibility to proclaim the warning message symbolized by the Hittical River, which identifies the king of the north as the papacy. More importantly, we must recognize and fulfill our responsibility to experience the message which is symbolized by the Ulai River, which points to the final work going on in the heavenly sanctuary. If we are unwilling to enter into the experience symbolized by the Ulai River, the message of the Hittical is of little value to us. Without the power received from an experience which enters into the veil of the most holy place, any warning message which we may proclaim will have little effect on those who may hear it and will avail nothing in our personal salvation. Um, and then he says his final paragraph in that chapter, it is possible to have a genuine experience with Christ in the most holy place without understanding the messages of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. It is also possible to understand Daniel 11, 40 to 45 without having an experience with Christ. The story of the two rivers in the book of Daniel is calling us to understand both. These testimonies are calling us to finish the work in our lives in order that we may help finish the work in this world by proclaiming the final warning message in the power of the Holy Spirit. The signs of the times testify that Christ is ready to close the story on these two rivers. Are we? Okay. So this king coming from the land of two rivers, as we were addressing yesterday. Yeah. And and just just a note here, just about this this Hebrew there, Aram. That's normally tra translated in the King James as Syria. Okay. So that's just that's where we get Aramaic from. It's Syriac or Syrian, or sometimes called Chaldean. Aram and Naharayim, uh, that just means two rivers. So. Um, so Syria of the two rivers is, I guess, how you would literally translate it. So in Greek, it's Mesopotamia. Pontamac means river. Meso means between. Okay. Are we to be between the two rivers? Are we to partake of these rivers? Symbolically or literally? Well, well, Jeff has them as two messages. One message is the message of, of, of understanding who the king of the north is. And right. the other is the message of understanding the sanctuary. So he, he symbolizes them basically in, in a simple way. Is one is the intellectual understanding of prophecy. And the other is the experience. That's the way it is, following Christ in the sanctuary, the message of the sanctuary. But but we had uh, Tess having the two rivers as Fox and CNN. Okay. And and Jeff then encountering that on September 7th, dealt with the fact that there are basically three parts of Babylon and, and that none of them, and, and the sources, the news media sources, there's three of them. And that was the Catholic one, the, the Fox, and then and CNN symbolically representing these uh, powers of Babylon. So he, he eventually rejected uh, Tess's argument that the two streams represented Fox and CNN. All right. So, so I mean, that's kind of... Uh, so that's really a difference, and I, I don't think we've really sorted that out, how to take, because um, we keep using that illustration that Tess was using, which is not the illustration Jeff was using of the UI in the Hittico. The, the purpose, as I looked at this, mm -hmm. I agree with what Elder Jeff had to say, but we need to revisit this to make sure that we have a clearer understanding mm -hmm. of the false 
application so that we can more greatly appreciate the true application. We're going to be confronted with those that would hold on to the false application. How do we kindly, gently, but yet directly present it to those that are holding on to these false applications? How do we witness to them? To help them to study as we've been looking to study. In my presentation for it's due in about ten days, uh, I sent it in last night, and I and I uh, mentioned that my current spiritual growth. I said when I attend these meetings, I said they're essential to my spiritual advancement, and I let it go at that, and just got right back into what I was uh, presenting. Okay. So I don't want to contend with anybody. I'm very forceful and contentious. And so I figure, you know, if they want to attack me, they want to banish me, that would be the worst. And of course it's going to hurt, but I'm praying and hoping that everybody comes into unity. And I mentioned, Dwight, I don't think I, I named you, but I said that repentance is, is uh, it will lead to unity. There is no unity without repentance. Right. Yeah, and, and going into, you know, battling people, it just puts up defenses. It doesn't do anything to, to restore them. Of course. <laughs> Took me was, a long time to learn that. Was I advocating in any manner that we need to be battling people? Nope. No, you weren't. So, yeah, that other network was... Uh, the Eternal World Television Network? Eternal World Television Network. World. EWTN. Is it World or Word? He put World. 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 Yeah. Word. Yeah. That came right straight out of their web page. Okay. Maybe they changed it, though. Global Catholic Television Network. Okay. Yeah, they have it as the Eternal Word Television Network. Okay. Um, but it could be that they changed it. I'll take a look. All right. Yeah, they were launched August 15th, 1981, it says here. <clears throat> okay. Where Jeff had them in 1996. Uh, Correct. Maybe it, maybe it became worldwide in 96. Maybe, maybe that's what, what it's about. Uh, I had that question earlier, but I, I, I you know, I, I never asked um, Jeff what, what that was all about. Okay, it says in 1996, Mother Angelica announced that EWTN would make its radio signal available via satellite to AM and FM stations throughout the United States at no cost. Well, that made it worldwide. Well, right. and not just local. Right. Yeah. So it was about Mother Angelica, whoever she is. Yes, I do remember him mentioning her name several times. Yeah. So I think that's what he's referring to in 1996. It's just interesting that it's August 15th 
1981 that they launched. Huh, that's interesting. <laughs> Is that becoming the because of the numerical chiasm or or what? August fifteenth. Okay. That's that. The fifteenth day of the eighth month is also, it's the midnight cry, but it's also um, um, the fifteenth day of the eighth month in nine seventy seven BC when Jeroboam is offering on the altar in Bethel. So it has different symbolisms to it, all of which are counterfeit. Yeah. Okay. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a savior to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othmael, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. One brother being of the 12 spies that comes back and gives a good report. One brother being raised up as a savior or a deliverer of the people. Um, so I got an observation about that hey, brother. Okay. Um, if he was his brother and Caleb and um, Joshua were the only two survivors that went over. Uh, he must have been much younger than his brother. Yeah. Quite possibly. Um. We also had people who were under 20 years of age at the time as well who crossed. Yeah, uh, again, please. Uh, people who were under people who were 19 years and younger also crossed. It was those who were um, over 20, 20 and over, but died in the wilderness. Yeah, so he would have been under under 20. When they when they crossed, that makes sense. Interesting. So, would that mean then that there was a an age difference between Caleb and his brother? Well, Caleb was thirty nine. So at least at least 20 years. Okay. So Caleb was 39 when they crossed, or Caleb was 39 when he was a spy? No, he was 40 years old when he was a spy. He was 39 when he when they crossed. At the most 39, he could possibly have been 38. But probably would have been late 38th, you know, sort of more towards his 39th birthday. Okay, I'm, I'm, all I'm trying to do right there, Stephen, is to fix this in my mind. Because I thought, as we had looked in the book of Joshua, that Joshua was the oldest in all of Israel, except for this with Caleb. And Caleb was just a little bit younger than he was when Caleb was about 80 years old, when he was apportioned out his portion of land, right? Well, it says he was 85. He was 85, right. Okay, thank yes. you. So he says that uh, he was 40 years old when he spied out the land. Right. And then uh, Four score, uh, he was then four score and five years old then. 
So that was 45 years later. So uh, they spied out the land they, after they had been in Mount Sinai for near enough a year after they uh, came out of Egypt. So um, he, I reckon he would have been about 39 then when he crossed the, the Exodus. Right. So it's possible then that Othniel was about, shall we say, 65 at the time that the land was apportioned unto Caleb? Yeah, that's possible. Okay. So Caleb is raised up as a deliverer of the people. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and went out to war and the land delivered Cushan Rishalthim king of Mesopotamia into his hand and his hand prevailed against this king and the land had rest for 40 years and Othniel the son of Kenaz died so if he was 65 at the time that the land was apportioned unto Caleb then we would be considering that he was approximately 105 when he died. Would that make logical sense? Well, you had the time when uh, Joshua was the leader for a time we don't know how long. So I reckon from when uh, Caleb was 85, right. most, it would have been another 24 years, at the very most. And then you had, um, talks about those who, the elders that outlived. Joshua continued on that Israel still served the Lord. But then we would consider that Othniel would be part of them, really. You know, I don't know. I wouldn't. So I don't know about the how I how to understand that. You know that. Uh, so I think if he was going to be sixty-five, he would be. You, you could maybe allow into maybe about one hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty. Is it possible? A calculation that uh, that must be able to try that. You know. But they could have been younger. They crossed the Exodus, the time of the Exodus, so it could have been like maybe 110 or something. Okay. I mean, if he, if he was to have been 110 by that point, we would have another symbol because that would play, that, that would point to uni, reunion or restoration. Because 110 would be part of that, right? Yeah, but it's I can't really prove it, no. Okay. So we're given a period. We're given this symbol that we need to come into repentance. Now, throughout all of this, if we have no repentance, the premise that, that was presented yesterday was without repentance, we do not come to a true understanding of the first angel's message. And that means that we could then not be benefited by the second angel's message.
that would place that we need to fear God. We need to repent of our sins in order to truly give glory to him. Is this premise logical to you? Does it make sense? Yes, yes, it does. <clears throat> Did the disciples repent of their sins prior to Pentecost? I mean, we recognize the fact that they've gave glory to God on the day of Pentecost. So my logic would say that they had to have repented of their sins. They, we know from the book of Acts that they confessed their sins to one another. If you do not have confession, do you have true repentance? No. Okay. Now, from the chat, could Judges 3 verse 10 mean two great battles since the deliverance into his hand is mentioned? I I don't understand the rest of the reference. Two CE, isn't that a, a year? That's the way I would normally take it. And then the 2 a.m. would be second Sorry. angel's message. <laughs> Sorry, I meant twice. I've always written, almost always written it that way. But okay. then I was going to add, read the above. It also means God's, God works for us. He wants us to work with him, cooperate with him. Contrast between God de delivering into his hand and his hand prevailed. I was just going to add that, but I'm a horrible, slow, and erroneous, erratic typist. So, Okay. So the question being asked is if Judges 3.10 have a reference to two great battles and do we apply this also with the the second angel's message is that correct um what, what's the two great battles oh i was just inquiring if it meant two great battles and then i thought maybe it means that God will work for us, but we need to work for him, you know, contrast between the Lord did so and so, and then his hand prevailed against Trishan Rishatseum. Yeah, I, I don't, I just don't understand why you're saying two great battles. Where's the two battles? That's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, that's, that's why I asked, does it mean there are two? Because first it says the Lord did so and so, and then it says on his hand prevailed, and I thought, does that mean there are two great battles? I thought, no, maybe it means that we need to work with God to accomplish the defeat of our foes, whatever problems we have in our lives, basically, mainly. Okay, I still don't understand why two. What? That's because there's one battle mentioned. Because, yeah, because there seem to, in my mind, there seem to be two 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 aspects of it right and i thought well cooperation with god god will do his part we need to do ours and then in the sense that our hand will prevail against whatever instead of just saying the lord did such and such in our lives does that make sense okay
so what we're what we're presented with here is that Othniel, who we are equating with the Holy Spirit, comes against this this king of of this this double darkness and prevails against him. Now we're being shown that the land had rest for 40 years and Othmael, the son of Kenaz, died. We are aware that the, the Holy Spirit strives with us so that the world is shown the messages of Revelation 14. Is the death of Othmael an equivalent symbol of the withdrawing of the Holy Spirit? Or is that something that, that would occur further down the line? It said it had rest for 40 years after that. Right. The question would be is when did he die? Okay. Well, I, I don't know if you would just take it that, that this would be then the Holy Spirit being withdrawn. I mean, because part of it, you just have symbols. Um, I mean, we have this literal thing, of course, Othniel is not the Holy Spirit. He's a, a judge. Um, but there's just the symbol of this 40 years period that would have to be understood to mean something, uh, some type of period in this symbol. It doesn't mean it's 40 days or 40 months or anything like that. But... Um, if we're going to try to apply it as a message in our time, it would be symbolic of a message that has accomplished its work. Not something that's just not the Holy Spirit withdrawn, but that it's, it's a complete period because 40, you know, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness and, and, and the Israelites wandered for 40 years. We have this symbol of 40 all throughout the Bible. So it's a complete fast. Um, it's, that means the Holy Spirit has accomplished its work. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Other thoughts or other questions at this time? Now, we will do a quick overview with Ehud, but our time is getting short. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. A question that comes up to me in these initial judges, could we apply the situation with Othnael similar to William Miller, and that the time where the land had rest for 40 years as being the time from 1844 to 1884. Is that a possibility? Well, I wouldn't do that. Okay. First off, I think that we have to, in this application, we have to just look at it as our history. 
Okay. Specifically because of chapter two, it's directed us to our history, not particularly to Millerite history or any other history. Not that there can't be any parallels there, but also I wouldn't apply the 40 years in a literal sense at all. Um, I would just look at it as a symbol. Okay. And, and also we would have to think that this is after 2001 that, that Othniel is doing this work. So this is the initial work that has to be done from 9-11. So that's the way that I would look at it. That's just my my understanding of this. Um, because because Jeff is also, he's represented in this case also by Joshua. So that would be prior to 9-11. And so, so the end of his work that he does, it would be the message. Jeff is giving this message. Um, but this message, I would think it more represents the aspect of this movement that is calling people to repentance, but it would have started uh, quite a bit earlier. So this would be some of the initial work that was done after 9-11, part of this message, which has continually been ignored, but it's going to be completed, right? So, because that's why to me, it's important that we can see that these, these run concurrently. That is, you have one start and this work had started but it's not really complete. Okay. Not yet. But it doesn't mean that we can't take the other ones and apply them earlier, like like before it's complete. So I, th I think we'll see this as we go through uh, how we have to look at this, how we have to put these messages, which are represented by judges, how we have to put them in place. Okay. And so we're going to be looking at this in symbolic rather than literal terms we're going to continue to look at these symbolically there may be application for the millerite time frame and the early portion of the church but we're going to look at it as having its greatest import for this time and that's the way we will continue to approach this over the next several studies. Now, our time is about to close. Are there any other comments or any other thoughts that you would like to share at this time? Yeah, I was just, I was just typing Eglon, meaning bull calf, refers to idolatry as in the golden calf in Exodus 32 and Jeroboam 2's abominations in 1 Kings 12 with a question mark. Well, let's let's get into this further than tomorrow. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just just a quick comment. Um, we had the Joshua have his time as leadership, and then it talks about those who um, crossed at the time of the Exodus. Those who were nineteen years or younger, um, and they died out talks about them and then after that there then they Israel apostatizes in a greater degree. Uh, so I'm thinking is the possibility that Othniel may may not have uh, crossed the Jordan as a young man because of that there because all the, the elders who crossed with Joshua had died out that entire time so so to me i would maybe put uh othniel to be in a lot younger than caleb okay. okay well you have you have the the crossing of the red sea right and that generation is going to pass away right yes but the crossing of the Jordan, I don't see why Othniel wouldn't be crossing the Jordan. No, no, no. I, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you were I, talking I, about the Red Sea? You were talking about the Red yes. Sea? The, okay. Yeah, you yes. said Jordan. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Did I say sense. Jordan? Sorry. Yeah. 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 
So yeah, I, I would say that that's definitely possible. But we don't know how old he is. But definitely he he was either he was either born in the wilderness or he was born he was he was quite young when they crossed the Red Sea. Those are both possibilities. Okay. Unless there's some exception there that they're not including him in there as being part of the elders that died out with Joshua. Yeah, I know. So it's hard to say. All right. I thank you each for your contributions today. So shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, I thank you today for the participation of those that have chosen to attend this meeting. We ask, Father, that we may be able to more properly apply that which we are reading. Help us to understand. Guide us to that which we need. Be with us as we go forward today so that all those that we come in contact with may see your character and not ours. Help us to go through this day safely. Be with us in everything that is to be done. May your will be done. For this we praise you and this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.